Welcome to Off Watch, our weekly interview series. Now, as we always say, we're taking your suggestions as to who we should be interviewing next. A lot of you asked for this guest, and it only seems fitting. After all, after that nail-biting finish in The Hague at the end of the last edition, we heard from Dongfeng Race Team, courtesy of Carolyn Brower, as to what was happening on board the Chinese boat. We heard with Xabi Fernandez the tension on board the Spanish team with Mafre. Now it's the turn of Bauerbecking and Team Brunel. But this wasn't the only point to talk to him. All those amazing stories from the Whitbread years, nearly sinking off Cape Horn and the difficulty in building a team for the last edition at the very last moment. A fascinating interview and if you enjoy it, leave us a like and subscribe for more. Enjoy. Bauer Becking is a legend of the ocean race, having competed in eight editions. So far, his scorecard can boast three third places and three second places, but no victories yet. Now, very few people keep coming back to the race to put themselves through another year of physical and mental grueling torture. But Bauer Becking is lining up to do the next edition of the race if all goes well in the autumn of 2021. So... Let me ask you then, as a first question, um, if you do get the victory in the next edition, which I'm sure you're going to be working very hard to do, and many people listening to this will be wanting you to do, if you do get that victory, is that it? Have you, have you scratched that itch then? Or, or are you, do you just keep coming back because this is, this is what you love to do? Well, of course, uh, I would love to win this race. I will be very honest about that. And that's always the aim. When you, when you start a campaign, that's, uh, the first objective is, of course, winning. And I think that's uh, all sailors have that in them. And it's not only sailors. I think it's any, any sport people who's in there you know, doing their, their, their job or their hobby, you, you like to win. So, so there's no doubt about that. The question if I would uh, put my, uh, my boots up in the trees, I very much doubt it because, first of all, I love the race. Uh, I think it's the best sailing what you can have. It's, it's no doubt about that. It's also the, the worst moments in life you can have. But I think that's the fantastic thing that you can just forget about them. Eh? It's, it's so easy. I think that's, that's so nice about us uh, human beings that we actually can just uh, forget about all the nasty, nasty things what you experience. And then I think uh, another really big part is what I like about it is just the, the, the team effort uh, and, and sailing in a team under yeah, sometimes very difficult conditions and get the best out of each individual. And I think especially the last part is when, when you're getting a little older and, you, and it's, it's just one of these things, I think I've got a, a lot to give. And I think even if, if I would win the next race, there's probably even more to give to, uh, to, to a younger generation. So uh, never say never, and, uh, but maybe my wife says, this is enough, <laughs> now you want it and you can stay home. But fair enough as well. And I would, of course, I would, uh, I would do that in also without a blink. Sure, okay. I, I won't hold you to that. You, you, you can let us know what those discussions are like at home later. Uh, but there's an interesting thing that you mentioned where you talked about the younger generation. We do have to mention the fact that um, I think it is... Wednesday next week, I believe, is going to be your 57th birthday. Have I got that one right? That's correct. Now, th this interview will go out on the Tuesday. So preemptively, happy birthday from everybody uh, listening into this. Um, the reason that I wanted to bring that up is in no way to just congratulate you on being still somebody at the forefront of a very physical sport at the age that you are. But because you've been involved with the sport for so long, you must have seen so many changes. And that's something I really want to get to. But before I do, I've got one question that, I, you know, I was, I was reading so much over the last few weeks, kind of preparing for this. Your first um, race in the ocean race, or back then, uh, the Whitbread Round the, uh, Round the World race was um, 85. And this was um, Philip's Innovator. And you stepped on board. You, you were on board that team as co-skipper. And I was desperate to try and work out what kind of CV would you have had to step on board that boat and be in such an important role? So you, can you fill in that blank for me? What was it that you had already experienced, already amassed before that very first start line that meant I can have a bit of responsibility on my shoulders? 
Well, I've done a fair bit at that age already in in, in, in ocean racing, and uh, and and especially uh, like in the days from the Admiral's Cup, probably people remember it was you representing uh, your country with free boats. So I was sailing on on that type of boats. Then I did a, a, f- a couple of uh, transatlantic crossings uh, and some races with uh, with great success. Where actually uh, we we won a couple on the boats where I was on. But I think uh, the, the most important part was uh, we had actually nearly a year of preparation. And in the year of preparation, uh, the, the skipper at that stage, uh, Dirk Nauta, probably saw something in me and, uh, and said, OK, in case w- the, the, the bad things are going to happen, I'd like you to be in charge and, and I call you my co-skipper. And, and in that sense, he was, uh, he was very open because he probably saw some things in me, what, uh, what he actually liked. And he gave me uh, yeah, a, a fair share of responsibility. And of course, uh, it's it, besides the co skip, I was a watch leader. But I think people shouldn't forget at all. He was the only paid guy on board, and that's that's of course one of the things as well. Uh, if you there were probably better sailors than me at that stage for sure, uh, but they would have been professionals. I think probably one of the first professionals. But that was just not the objective. And uh, so he just probably took me as he thought that I was the best person for the job. And that's why I got it. And this is at the age of, what, 22? I mean, be, I, I, I mean, not old, not, not, you know, not, not a veteran like you are now. And to have somebody turn around and say, um, OK, if something was to go wrong, you're going to be the person that everyone's going to follow. Was that something that you wanted? Or did that suddenly feel like, Oh, I've, I've, I've got quite a bit of uh, responsibility now that not necessarily I want. I think uh, if I look back, I, I probably didn't even think a minute about it because that, that's <laughs> one of these things. Uh, everything was new. You, you just have to imagine. Uh, we just did, of course, we sailed uh, two times across the Atlantic, <clears throat> Atlantic with the boat uh and and did a fair bit of uh, preparation short short distances mm. i did mainly uh, i did mostly all the deliveries so i was responsible without the skipper because he very often drove with his car to the next place because of course you had to do things uh, with the sponsors back home so it was just yeah it's just one of these things eh? uh, you take it on as a as a young because we were a very young group of uh, of people and it, and it just, I think, came natural. But I, I wasn't thinking a, a moment about it. Uh, now, now I'm the skipper when the skipper is not there. Or, or what will happen uh, in worst case, uh, they get sick and they can't sail a leg, for example. You, you, you don't think about it at that age. So and you just take the bullet on and, uh, and go sailing. And it was a pretty good first entry into the race as well. You know, you finished with a, with a second. Already your CV is starting to look pretty strong. I want to bounce further back because I'm wondering I mean is it a moment like that this is a race big on the world stage you finish with a second your name's pretty high like you say watch leader co-skipper you know you've got a lot of responsibilities you can take a lot of pride in that uh performance was that an event that cemented your love for competitive sailing or you know what was that first moment where you where you got into a boat when you were young was it an instant love or was it your parents you know, throwing you out onto the water to get a nice break on a Sunday afternoon. Well, of course, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't even when I was much younger, of course, you start in the dinghy, then you start racing. And I think with all the people who are competing, once they have that in them, uh, they like the competition, they like to win. Of course, I have to be very honest about that because it's just, that's just a great kind of doping you can get. And winning is just a fantastic feeling. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with the race when I when well became second place, and that catapulted myself actually into a professional sailing. And and of course it's a choice what you have to make. Uh, at that stage, uh, Rolf Rolick, uh, probably most people know uh, uh, Udolf Rolick design from uh, from the Alingi campaign. But Rolf was already very successful and uh, designed uh, yeah very good uh, <clears throat> boats in uh, in Germany, especially in Germany. And our boat Philips Innovator was one of his designs. So we had a close contact with him, and uh, he brought me actually in contact with uh, with, a, with a former German owner, uh, Hans Otto Schumann, and uh, he said he's going to build a new boat, and he's looking for somebody to to run the boat. Uh, so being the boat captain, and of course you're getting paid for it, means you have to move to Germany, and I think it was just one of these things. Uh, the, the German teams were uh, were one of the best in the world, 
and I saw it as an opportunity to become a better sailor and, and to be in a very competitive team and, uh, and to learn as much as possible. And that's what uh, basically I did uh, after the race was finished, uh, the Wet Bread Round the World race. Uh, two or three months later, I, uh, I moved to Germany. What, I mean, what was going to be your career path before that? Because like you say, that, that was the bit that made you a professional sailor. I mean, you know, we've, we've all got to make a buck here and there. What were you lining up to do? <laughs> For me, it was, uh, I always, because it's just very honest. I saw the documentaries from, uh, from Connie van Rietschoten with the flyer and, and people just have to remember in the old days, there was not coverage mm. daily, even videos or television. There was just one documentary. Maybe there was a little blink in the line that he won a leg, but at both his races, he, there was a fantastic documentary. And when I saw that, I said, this is what I wanted to do. And even with... That in back mind, I said, okay, how can I make my chances any bigger? So I actually choose to uh, go to nautical school because I thought if I'm getting a little bit of navigation knowledge, radar, all that kind of things, the radio telephony, but of course in the old days, was uh, all the communication was done by, by long range. So I thought if I pass that, then probably my chances will be better to get on board of a boat. So it was never an intention to go to sea. I always wanted to do the race and then I would see afterwards what, uh, what would happen. And, uh, and then I started making my career out of it. I didn't know when I started the race actually doing. So it just came up. There was an opportunity. And I thought, this is what I really like to do. I mean, nowadays, um, I think there is quite a clear path for a lot of sailors if they want to become a professional. Like you say, there's qualifications. There's even sailing schools. Sign up to us for eight months and we'll get you these tickets and you will be a professional. Back then... Was there any way to go from looking at the documentary, dreaming big and going, if I walk down this route, I will end up on those race boats? I think in that sense, it's, it's nothing different than uh, from the old days. Eh? Right now as well. I think if you're just young and eager, just, just do your best. Just but what I did as well in, uh, when I was really young, walk around the docks, look at the, the docks, I mean, so just the jetties of the, in the harbours, look where the really good boats are. So you even can just give them a hand with deliveries, uh, scrubbing the deck afterwards, get a chance. Do you need somebody? And, uh, and I think it, in that sense, it's still the same because I think like right now, of course, there is a lot of sailors who pretend to be professional or want to become a professional. And, and it's very likely that they're coming out of the Olympic classes because they are already professionals when they're doing the Olympics. But I think there's so many other people because very often as well with Olympic sailors is that they're doing it either by themselves or just with, with one other crew member or maybe two other crew members. And, and it's, it's a big difference to make that, yeah, to go sailing with a group of 10 people than that you're just doing it by yourself. So, so very often, and I think it surprises the people very often, that Olympic sailors don't like to go on the ocean because they, they just use normally the, to come every night back, having their coach and doing their own things. And all of a sudden you're coming in an environment where, uh, yeah, where you all of a sudden uh, are maybe not even the, on the top of the of the, of the ranking anymore. <laughs> so it's a it's it's a, it's a tough one for them very often. And of course, uh, if you if you're sitting for a week or fourteen days in a row on the water, a lot of people just don't like it. Very simple, they just hate it. So that's unfortunately a lot of professional Olympic sailors just basically don't make the cut. And I think in that sense, and that's I think always what you do. You try to, to establish and get a team together where the person, because people who apply and get on board, they're all very good sailors, but especially that mental part and that they fit into a team that is an as important aspect, so not more important sometimes than being the, the, the Olympic gold medal winner. Really interesting you talk about that that mental side of it because you know I, I i've always i've always enjoyed the phrase that you know everybody wants to stand on the top of everest but not everybody wants to climb all the way up i'd love to be up there if someone could you know i don't know helicopter or something for you with that with that mental fortitude that is so vital in a race like this those those first few editions that you did you know that first uh, you know, um, with uh, Philips Innovator and then with the uh, Whitbread 60 classes on um, Winston and things like that. Did you, did you get tested in a way that proved to yourself that actually, I, you know, I can do this? Or, or was, it, was it just, yeah, I mean, it was just a natural fit. Never at any point did you, did you think, oh, this is tougher than I thought. 
I think uh, especially if you go back to the to the first one, uh, I think that's that's of course that's the easiest one to, to speak about in, in, yeah. in that re respect. It's uh, so we just didn't know what to expect. Hey, that's what I said. We we seen the documentaries. We sailed in warmer waters, and then all of a sudden you're getting down south in the Southern Ocean. And of course, you've heard a couple of stories from because our skipper had done it t uh, two times before the race. So you hear a couple of things. But actually, the moment when you're getting down south there, and especially in the old days, there was no restrictions in the, how far south you could go. So we were sailing at uh, probably 58, 59 south, and icebergs left and right, and you, you just didn't think about it. And, and, and I think at that moment, I just enjoyed it so much. I said, this is just fantastic. And I think that is all, and I think that's, that's the main reason why I'm coming back all the time, because I just realized how nice the sailing can be. And I think that's probably the most important thing just yeah, to realize it's, uh, yeah, you have a fantastic sport. You say you enjoyed it so much being down there, with icebergs towering over the boat. I would assume that a little bit of fear in a situation like that is probably a healthy thing. I think fear didn't, didn't, but it basically didn't happen over there because it's just one of these, I think, you, especially when you're young, you, you don't think about it. You just say, oh, oh so this, this is like how it is. We have uh, 40, 50 knots of breeze and uh, we maybe can just hang on uh, with, uh, with the sail area, what we have. And I, I, I think you, you're, not getting, you're not getting scared because it's just one of these things. Well, this is the ocean. Or this, is the, this is the Whitbread Round of All Race. This is how it's supposed to be. And, uh, and of course, then afterwards, when you grow up a little bit and you've done a couple of more races, you know, actually, oh, bad things can probably happen or I've been in this situation before. So uh, it's, it's always nice to look back to the first one. Um, let's talk to some of those highs and lows then, because you say that things can go wrong. So let's jump to 2005-6, uh, uh, Movistar. You're skippering the boat. Um, I spoke to uh, Chris... Nicholson not that long ago and he was talking about the moment where you guys had to step off the boat on the transatlantic leg but he also mentioned Cape Horn and you guys coming in uh, towards Cape Horn doing really well on the leg you know second at the time and then all of a sudden the boat starts leaking and it starts leaking quite fast this was not an incident it wasn't something that I remembered but it was interesting to hear it from Chris it clearly was something that stuck in his mind as somebody that was skipper on that boat, what was that moment like where you go, hang on a minute, there's water and a lot of water inside the hull? I think uh, just if you compare the two incidents, and I think Chris is 100% right, the Cape Horn experience, let's call it that way, was, uh, was way more scary because I think already at that stage, you just knew this is the Southern Ocean. And in the Southern Ocean doesn't have any mercy. Uh, luckily, we were not too far off from Cape Horn, but still, I think it was 300 or 350 miles. But just the moment when it happened, and, and I think somebody went downstairs in that sense was very lucky. Uh, we were pushing hard and we, and we were going like a rocket. And, and it's just one of these things. You enjoy the sailing and, and somebody, and because it is cold, so somebody went down for a cup of coffee and came screaming back on deck and say, we are sinking. So then straight away everybody looking because we didn't really feel it on the boat at that stage. But uh, you go downstairs and then if you realize you're standing nearly to your hips into the water, something is not right. So, and especially then realizing you are so far away from land, you only can rely probably on a competitor when it goes bad. And even when you have to go on a life raft, when you sink over there, you know, the chances are not very looking very good for you that you actually survive even in the, the best life raft and, uh, and, and with, your, with your survival suits because uh, even when they, when, you, when, when other boats try to find you, because there's no other boat, so you, you're totally by yourself. So I think that was way more scary. Can we get the situation under control? And, uh, and probably Chris told the, told the story because we had already some uh, water pumps on board at that stage. It was, it was a really great thing in the regulations. And, uh, and Chris, uh, because everything was shorted out, he had the smart idea to, to connect the water pumps directly to the batteries. And, uh, oh, so th and this is where he had to go under the water, he, I think. I, had, I, I, I read to, this he somewhere. To, he basically had to dive underwater. And uh, I wouldn't have come on the ND. Great. And it's still for Chris, fantastic thoughts uh, at that stage. Uh, 
he connected and of course got, got belted quite a bit as well because that's just with uh, electricity and water is not very good but he got the pumps going and in the meantime we uh, we closed the hole which was actually not too bad but of course uh, if you have a hole from uh, i think it was probably 75 by 75 uh and because it was a cover of the canting keel system so we stuffed at that stage we had spinnakers we stuffed some spinnakers in the hole and and basically could stop the water more and more coming in and then chris got the pumps uh, connected and uh, we could slowly but surely uh, empty uh, empty the boat out but that was a way more scary situation than what happened with uh, when, well, basically when we had to abandon ship because uh, we knew the moment it was happening we still were like for 14 or 15 hours on board and of course i had to make the call and the the, we, the good thing was that the uh, abn2 at that stage uh, had diverted to us they were right next to us and and then it was just a matter of okay do i take the decision yes or no and of course you're very hesitant mm. because first of all you say we still afloat because we had the the keel basically tied up onto the rig we had halyards down uh, through the through the coach roof tied around the whole system and that was basically holding the keel in the boat but the biggest thing was just that there was uh, uh, the, the weather conditions who were coming up. There was a huge low coming. And ABN MRO2, then Sebastian just said, we have to know about this and this time because we have to stay ahead of this, uh, this huge uh, low pressure because otherwise uh, I might be jeopardizing even my, the rest of my team. And then together with Glenn Burke, uh, because he was at that stage uh, the boss at uh, the Volvo Ocean Race, we had, a, we had a great plan and uh, we just said, okay, let's just execute it. And of course, I was in contact with, with our uh, sponsors and with, uh, with Pedro Campos. And we just said, let's just not take the chance. How proud we will be that we can maybe ride this storm out and we might bring the boat back. But let's abandon over here and, uh, and, and stop, step in the life raft. And we did. And that was all very, com because we talked, we talked a lot about all the scenarios, how we do the transfer. It was at daylight and uh, we did the transfers. and uh, and, and basically got saved on board AB and Amaro and, and sailed off for them uh, going direction of England. And of course, uh, the storm came through and uh, I think it was about uh, 10 or 15 hours later that, uh, that the boat actually disappeared uh, off, the, off the tracker. And I think another really important thing is because it's always one of these things when boats are sinking, people just always say, ah, oh, but how big were the waves? There was a, there was a ferry going from France to, to Ireland a big car ferry and they blew out all the windows on the bridge that night so there must have been waves of 10 12 meters and of course that was not oh. the boat was just couldn't hold out so that was gone and uh, once we were in england we went of course uh, with search planes uh, around in the latest locations but uh, we never found the boat back and that's of course sad as such but uh, I'm going to say that the Cape Horn as such was way more scary because it was all of a sudden and you had to act on that moment. That's a real test for the for the skipper, you. Um, I think, you know, sailors, we spend so much time learning about what to do if the wind shifts this way or what to do if a competitor attacks on you in this way. And we know how we should react in those situations. Let's go to the Cape Horn one. Let's go to the one that scared you, the one that unraveled very quickly. A crew member comes up and says, we're sinking. Everyone turns to you as the skipper. Looking back, did you do well in that split second to lead and control the situation? Or do you look back at it and think, oh, I was a bit green. I would have done things differently now. No, I think in, in, the, in the, the big picture, I think I did a lot of good things. I did right. And maybe people remember because we went into a swire. And, uh, and there, was, there was an interview going on. Uh, and where actually uh, I, but, but the people from Volvo, from the press department asked that they could sit in. And then they, because I was just asking the, the, the crew, say, are you not believing in me anymore? Because I was just confronting and it came on camera and it was cut in a little bit of a bad way because afterwards I said, this was not the, the way how I actually, how the picture was, or how the whole story was told. But I asked all the, all the individuals, is it something against me or is there no trust in the boat uh, anymore? And there was a couple of guys who didn't have trust in the boat anymore. And, uh, and actually one person uh, flew, uh, flew to the next stopper. We didn't sail the last part into, uh, into, the, into the finish place. But I think if I look back, not only myself, I think the entire team, because that's, that's still, I make the calls, maybe the really big ones. 
but it's still a team effort and that's uh, and i think that's that's one of the great things uh, i think what you ex- really experience when the shit hits the fan because that what was happening that you just have can be really proud how your you, your entire team operates in that kind of situation because it's me, maybe me making the final calls but everybody is chipping in 100% at that stage because everybody is thinking not only not so much about themselves, but they all think about their loved ones back home. And that's, of course, especially when the skipper, you just always think I have to bring these guys or girls back to their loved ones because that will be the most horrible thing whatever could happen in my career. And maybe I should just tell one more little history because we're talking about scary things. Uh, when, when Movie Star was uh, launched uh, just in the beginning, we actually decided that we would sail from Australia back uh, to Spain. And uh, of course, you're going through the Southern Ocean because we thought we can learn a really a lot of things over mm. here. And uh, so we did that trip. We, we started really late because that's always one of these things. The boat was new and uh, a lot of things happened. We broke quite a few things already in the, in, in the trials. But then we sailed uh, towards Cape Horn and then we actually broke the 24 hour records, the, the, the world sailing record. Oh, right. And we did some, I think out of my head, 525 miles. So that was, everybody was in a ray, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of feeling. And it was just getting windier and windier and windier. And then we had, uh, because we couldn't fill, and there was one of these things, it was the first time ever in, in probably 40, 45 knots. We, we, we didn't have really good furling techniques at that stage. And it went terribly wrong because it started, I think, 45, 50 knots, and we made a Chinese jibe. And that has been the most scary moment ever in my life because I think it was like 30 or 40 seconds afterwards, of course, pitch dark, massive waves. Then all of a sudden we saw a light floating behind us. And of course, everybody had their life jackets on. Yeah. And at that moment, just my, well, my heart, and just everything, I was just frozen. So, and, and I think it was one of these things, and I think a lot of people should really have that exercise in them, that you have to have a roll call on the numbers of the people, because you can scream and everything around, but people start forgetting about it. But if you go one, two, three, say till 10 or to 12 people who are on board, then you know that everybody's there. And once we did a roll call, you know, thank God everybody is safe but just that moment and the feeling seeing that light disappearing and and we laying on our side doing probably six seven knots going sideways uh and and you see that light disappearing Uh, uh, you that was i think the most scariest moment in my life ever i had on on a racing battle i i think as a that would be the end i think for a lot of people in 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 a position of leadership and responsibility you know a skipper i wonder whether you know with things like that, bringing the crew together in Ashwire and talking to everybody and saying, look, what's the problems? What can we do? Is that something you really enjoy shepherding the young sailors, the new sailors into and then safely through those moments and making them better sailors? Well, it's, it's not shepherding because that, that is just, I think, I think that's just one of the things when you have a great team. And I think just making a huge step, if you go to the last race, just how we grew as a team uh, with communication and with responsibilities. I think that's always, even like in the earlier days, I always try to, to be open-minded and d- direct. And sometimes people blame me for being too direct, but at least I, I hate it when all, not all the cards getting on the table. And so if you get all the cards on the table, people can react, either they shut up, but I rather have to have, give input and that I can learn from it, but everybody in the team can learn from it and you can make progress. So I probably had that already in my in the, my earlier part of the career. I always had that kind of feeling, and that's probably just the person who you are. I think a lot of people can still learn it, but I think especially in the, in moments when things are maybe not going all right, then uh, some might lose their their temper or just fall into a in, in some sort of a panic mode, let's say that way, and make wrong decisions, and then things go wrong. So that's why it's so important that the entire team should be as well prepared for the worst case scenario. And it's uh, even when you're sailing a fastnet race, I think all the skippers, they should just say, guys, let's just go over this. And I think in that sense, Australian sailors, the Sydney Hobart people, they have a fantastic way of explaining things. And because they had that huge bad experience a couple of years ago, and they have got now a 
yeah, a, a way of, of doing things, but a lot of people can learn from. But I think just say to everybody, whatever, even when you sail a hundred miler, let's go out and speak about what can happen, worst case scenarios, how we're going to act, who's doing this, who's doing that. And I think that's a, that's a thing that people should think about before they go out. One of the reasons why people will be able to think about things like that is because, as you say, the race, the ocean race has changed so much over the years that now we can take the video from those moments. You can see what, what was happening down there in the Southern Ocean. So I want to talk about um, Telefonica Blue, 2008 09. Another really good uh, year for you. So third, you know, really strong. Sailing on those, on those boats, big, powerful boats, you know, being down there. Does it convey to us watching here? Do we get any sense of actually what it's like? Well, I see that moment and my heart stops, but I'm guessing that's just, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's, of course, fantastic with, uh, with, with now with the footage, what you can have from on board mm. and off the boat, but still the, the, the noise, <laughs> yeah. the huge cold temperatures and just the intensity of the wind. That is still something what people cannot really get into them because it's just one of these things it's it's not a they see a clip of like one or two minutes and say wow that's fantastic but they should just remember this goes on one hour two hours 24 hours 48 hours and so on and on and on so people just are just a, they are just running on adrenaline and, uh, and and that is just the thing. What 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 it will be, and it will be. People will never realize how hard it is because it is it is a bloody hard sport. And I think if we just look back at the last race, we had one day where we had fantastic. I think forty around forty forty five knots. We were in the lead, and then I said to Jan Ryu, "Just imagine that people could see this." I said, "Just get the drone up in the air," and he just said, "Ah, oh, but there's a big chair. I've never flown the drone in that much breeze." I said, just get it in the air. If you get this footage, it, it will just it not only will great for our sponsors, but as well just the home front and, mm. and all the spectators can just see, really see what it is like. And uh, and I think that was, yeah, I think that was one of the one of the great things about it, just to show that uh, how how fantastic sailing can be and how harsh it can be. And that I think was another moment where uh, where people saw, holy smoke, this is not just. Uh, a beer cam race. I, I, I mean, the, the drones were amazing. I do remember all that footage. You know, this poor little drone defenselessly trying to chase down this 65 as you guys were crooning through the Southern Ocean. But it's interesting you talk about trying to convey that race and those little things that we don't get to know. Because obviously the onboard reporters in on board with you, sharing bunks, working really hard, uh, you know, I'm noticing that, you know, you've got a virtual background on at the moment because, you know, we're in, you know, we're communicating in your home. There's certain things, you go, oh, it's my home. I don't, you know, have a little bit of privacy. What's it like having an onboard reporter on those moments where suddenly you get overtaken and the onboard reporter puts a camera in your face? Something disastrous has happened. A camera goes in your face. Is It's important for the, us watching the race. What's it like for you as a sailor? Well, it's just terrible. It's, just, it's really <laughs> terrible. It's just, you, you rather punch him or her in the face and say, knock off, you've got better things to do over here. But I think, I think that's one of the things, and I think that's one of the great things about all the people who are on board. They just realize we're here mm. because the sponsors are paying this. I think we have such a great mentality towards the sponsor and to, even to the race organizers as well, because they had had <clears throat> Volvo in the past, there wouldn't have been a race. And they can just, they just know that these moments are probably can pay a campaign back. We know bad results can be good results in, in a way, and you can always twist it. But of course, it's terrible. And I think what was not, not, not so nice in the last race was that uh, we got allocated uh, OBRs, onboard reporters. So we were shifting from one person to the other thing. Yeah. And, 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 and that, just, that, did, that just didn't work. And that's one of the reasons why now the rules luckily got changed, that everybody can find their own person. Because it is such an important part that, that the OBR is, even the, and they, they were in the last race, some were really like team members and, and, and a lot of context still going on right now. But if you don't have that whole build up and then all of a sudden something bad is happening, it is way harder to even to speak to somebody who's you, you might know him or her pretty well 
for the time that you've been sailing. You've been sailing for 10 days with each other. But, but still, if there is a, a, a bigger bond, then that, yeah, let's, let's just say that uh, there's like a curtain in between that is just disappearing if you have like everybody on the team. Let's, let's go to, you keep teasing me with, with the last edition. And you know exactly what I'm going to ask you about the last edition. You know what everybody wants to hear about the last edition, but I'm going to leave that moment hanging for just, just a, a second longer. I just want to talk about um, something I mentioned at the beginning. Considering you've been in this game for so long, you've seen so many changes. One of those changes obviously being from the open aspect of the design to the fixed one design with the uh, VO 65s for the last two editions. And of course, they'll be in the next one as well. Um, one of the things that w when I talk to a lot of people about, you know, boat breakages and, you know, what, what happened to you with, um, I mean, on, on Telefonica Blue, you had, you had your, your bow section break up as well, didn't you? You had a, you had a leak coming in there. I don't think it, it, it Correct me if I'm wrong. It didn't go through the bulkhead, but you had the sort of, you know, the the um, a bow damage in there. You know, you were you were injured at this point, I think. But no, down below, hoping. Oh, about I was I was injured actually at the, at the beginning of that storm. But uh, there was Telefonica Black who uh, who basically cracked through the middle over there. So we came we came through, yeah, basically without any issues. Uh, so, but it was one of the boats, and it was a lot of boats. Uh, we know Ericsson, I think it was Ericsson three or four. One, they uh, they had a big hole in the bow, and and luckily just made it to uh, to Taiwan, and then actually won the next leg. So, yeah. <laughs> but is that is it a good thing? Do you see going from boats where, with the pursuit of speed, you can make some compromises in strength reliability, to go from that to we're going to give you a boat that's going to be able to get you around the world. It's up to you what you do with it as sailors. What's your preference? Well, of course, I prefer uh, the one design concept. And I think uh, they've been proven 100% right. First mm -hmm. of all, uh, for us sailors, and I just have to speak especially, of course, about myself, we have the same tool. And if somebody else is better than me, then I have to accept, of course, that, uh, that they beat me. But it is you having the same tools, and it just says something about the team again. And it's not about the money, because even like in the last race, we, we probably the, the team with the, the least amount of budget. Hmm. Uh, we started the, and the, the last of everybody, and and that's not an excuse because that is a choice. When we knew that we were so late, we said, okay, we probably have a chance to come on the podium, and if we are really good, uh, we might even win it. And, and I think that was exactly what happened. We were not good in the beginning, but our learning curve was all the time up and it never went down. And I think uh, that's why we became uh, yeah, fierce opponents for, for the other two boats in the end. And, uh, and it was just keep going, keep going, keep learning, go faster. Okay, so let's talk then. Okay, you've, you've reeled me in. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the last edition. Obviously, this is the second one with Team Brunel, the VO65. I mean, in, in the 2014-15 race, you finished second. So you obviously know how to make a 65 go fast, at least in that edition. Then it, obviously, when you get to the start line of the 17-18 edition, I mean, you know, you guys were not at the pace that some of the other boats were. And the first few legs, um, those results must have been disappointing. Where were you in your mindset, in your thinking within that team when, you know, a couple of legs in and you think we're not closing down the leaders yet? What effect did that have on you? Well, it's, it's always one of these things. Yeah. I'm I'm very positive in a way, and 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 of course, uh, and actually quite early in the race already we knew that, that that we were that we were going all right, and we knew we were not we were not very quick in the big breeze because we just didn't have the, didn't have the experience over there, but already on the leg uh, going into Hong Kong, even that we had I think four new people on board for, because we had to make some changes because of circumstances that happened injured and somebody was ill back home and had to fly back. So there was was a, there were a couple of, of changes, but then on the leg from uh, from Hong Kong, we 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 really st I started seeing things where I said, "Shit, we're having a really fantastic team over here, and we're going we're going well." And 
and even that we lost out in the end coming into Auckland, we sailed a, a very good good leg. But of course, then you're coming in Auckland, I think we were second last or last. Then it's, uh, then there's of course the pressure is not only from back home, because back home I'm talking sponsors. Mm -hmm. And that is just the moment that you have to start explaining. And I think that's really important. Like I, I'm really lucky that uh, Gideon Messing, uh, who has done the race uh, three times as a sailor, was our project leader or my CEO, let's call him that way. So he really understood all the time what it was and you can explain to him yeah and then he can see it as well you are unlucky somewhere sometimes that's because that's one of the really bad things about our sport uh, there can be just that somebody's sailing one mile away from you and the next day he's 100 miles ahead of you and 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 that's i can explain it to him but i can't explain it to a sponsor so the sponsors were not very happy and understandable right? they say you're having the world's best sailors peter burling carl langford uh, <laughs> yeah. all these guys and girls yeah. you're having why are you not winning and, uh, and that's, of course, that's frustrating. So, but I think just with the backup, and, and I think that was the nice thing as well with Brunel. They always, because they've done the race now so many times, they knew this is an investment because we had a, a relatively young, inexperienced team. And it, was, it fitted ex in that sense very much in their philosophy, what they're doing in their business. They're getting young people, build them up, they lease them out to other companies. And that's what, basically what they saw in our project. And then, of course, when we started sailing that uh, next leg, and I think it was one of these things as well. It was not all, everybody came in the flow, and and it is and that's what where you have to be as a team. Like what I said, everybody just realized we are good, but we have to get better, and we actually can do it. And I think that was uh, that happened on the on the leg to uh, to uh, Itaji around Cape Horn. Then we were really in that mode, and and we really had the right balance in the team. And we, we knew how to sail the boat fast. I, I mean, it was a step change. I, I mean, it really was. And, and, and suddenly... Yeah, that's for the outsiders. That's really for the outsiders. Mm. And that's what I said. We had already that feeling in the team on the leg before, even a little bit going into Hong Kong already. But we just knew we were making huge steps. And then all of a sudden, it was just materializing. And, and it's one of these things as well. If you are getting fast and faster, sometimes you can cover up a little bit the things where you may be not doing that 100% right. And of course, that helps That helps a lot as well. What, did you have any, um, did you have any pressure during that, should we say that first sort of half of the race where, like you say, you know, you having to talk to sponsors, having to talk to people. Did you, were you receiving pressure, maybe not from the sponsor, but from elsewhere to make changes with the team? did you have to sort of um, hold on to your belief that we've got the right kind of people or as the skipper, were you, were you, were you being left alone at that point to, you know, we trust you, you're going to, you're going to get, get the best you can. Well, of course it's, it's one of these things. I've got the responsibility to pick the team and that, that's really fantastic. Uh, with, with also with Brunel, but I could just, they just, you take whoever you think is the best. Mm. But what has happened even in the last race, when you start really late, you don't have time to build your team. And that was, of course, you, we, had, we had fantastic individual sailors, but not always everything is, is bonding uh, 100%. And then you have to start listening because I can say, oh, I can work with him or her really well. And, and then all of a sudden, there's other people in the team who don't think it was working very well. So if you get that communication going, and I think that was happening with us, in the, especially in, in, in the beginning stages, basically until Auckland, we were just saying, where can we make steps? Who fits really 100% in the team? Uh, what other person are we looking for? Who can maybe just give us that little bit of extra what, what we are not having? And, and that just came through, through talking with each other. It's not only me, because if, if I make decisions, but the rest of the team is not standing 100% behind it, then it's then it's never going to work, and and when the when you're in, in deep troubles, then the, the team will fall apart, and and I think that that is that curve that we have been building and building and building, and I think one of the things uh, probably the people well know we had uh, in both last races, we had actually uh, like a mental coach in our team, mm, sure, and, yeah, and and that was I think it's was one of our great assets because. Uh, not only for myself, I got a lot of uh, backup from her, also from things what I probably didn't pick up. Uh, she was really a part of the team. Other people trusted it, and sometimes they didn't maybe want to say it to me, 
I spoke to her and then Peter Backdoor came to me and then I could actually, have, we could, could challenge them and when you're sitting in a debrief or just in a, in a chat to say, well, this came to my mind and it, it was you, I just say Peter because I don't know Peter Burling, don't, don't, don't be angry with me, he doesn't <laughs> care about what I say. But uh, that, that's, uh, that, that was the approach what we had and I think that was, uh, was working really well. How did, how did you see those, I mean, those Olympic, America's Cup stars, Carlo Hussman, you know, Pete Burling, how did you see them become offshore uh, talents heroes. in their own I right? Think you, yeah. you can, I think you can call them heroes because they have got so much in them. And, and a guy like, I'm just now saying Peter Burling, eh? Sailor of the Year, World Sailor of the Year. I don't know how many bloody medals he won and, 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 winning, the, and winning the Cup. But he's, he's just so down to earth. But Oh, they are so good. Him, Carl, and, that, and now we're just talking about these guys and Carlo. And those other guys on board as well. Yeah. We shouldn't forget that. Abby, fantastic. She was boat captain, took that responsibility. So it's everybody in the team. KP, if you're listening, you know, I love you and you don't want to hear that, but you, he's one of the best. So it's, it's, not, it's not all these individuals, but I think the thing with, with, with the new generation and, and the guys coming from the America's Cup and from the Olympics, they just are specialists in refining and getting the last little twitches out of the boat. And they did a fantastic job on that. And that was one of the things as well, just in the responsibility roles, who's going to do what. They, they took it on and, and they delivered. And we can say that. We didn't win, but they, they stepped up massively. The final leg, we were on a three-way tie. Dongfeng race team, one point behind, but they have this extra bonus point for lowest lap time. So effectively, whoever wins or whoever beats who in that final leg, they're going to be the people that, that um, walk away with the trophy. That final leg, I mean, the tension and everything else, the showdown, I, I can't see it being repeated. For you... Did you look at the weather forecast? Did you look at the routing? And did you think, hang on, this is going to be really tough to call? Well, it, it, it was anyway, because we really didn't know wh where we were going. There was, there was options in that leg for, for virtual waypoints mm. and, and, and all kinds of things. We had to go to, to the city of Aarhus here in Denmark. So there were so many... There was so much land effect as well in place. And, and you know, especially at that time of the year, you can have uh, where I live, the north, northern part of, uh, of the island of Copenhagen is on. I look out of the window right now and there's no wind. And 20 miles further down the coast, it blows 25. So there are so many local effects. And I think that was just, it's just one of these things. Uh, you have the weather and, you, and we knew once we were on the, on the western side of, um, of Denmark in the North Sea, it would be a little bit more predictable, but but the part in the in the Baltic and in the in the Skagerrak uh, that's that can be so tricky in this year. And it, and it was in the last race. It was exactly that, and we missed terribly out in the beginning. I think at one stage we were twenty miles behind Marfa and uh, and Don't think. But of course that's still. And then you have to start keep keep plugging away, guys. And it's it's just one of these things. And if, and that that's just the whole team was fantastic in that sense. Uh, you know you're behind, but you just have to keep keep going. And because we, huh, you, you, I, mean, I maybe probably even mentioned uh, the Newport finish. They say a day before, Mafra was a hundred miles behind us, and they beat us. They win the leg. So we knew it's not over until the fat lady sinks, and, and that will be the finish line. So that spirit was all the time there. And then, of course, uh, the moment came when we had to make a, a crucial decision, which model we're going to follow and of course everybody talks about Dong Feng doing a fantastic job and, and of course they did a fantastic job because they won but that option was very clear on the on the table but people should just remind in our position because Mafra was at that stage leading the race they were mm. together with, uh, with Dong Feng a little bit ahead we were a little further offshore <clears throat> five six miles behind them but we had that speed and we were just reeling them in slowly but surely and then we're sitting with KP and with Peter. We talked about, okay, what are we going to do? If we follow them, it's going to be probably very unlikely that we're going to pass them. Yeah. As well, we have the Apache, that's the French model. We know Dong Feng is, is going to live with that French model. They're going that, that route. And we said, Mafra will stay with Dong Feng because they're ahead. Rule number one, simple. 
stay between the competition yeah, and the finish. So we're taking, because it was only like 10 minutes difference. And of course, the difference was on the, on the EC, the European model, was actually 10 minutes in advantage of us, even from the position where we were behind the other guys. So then we, we took that choice because that was, first of all, was the right choice, but before it was gonna be the prediction. But then the other thing was that we knew, oh, we just fought, my friend, they, they go the other way. So that's probably the biggest chance of actually winning. If we follow them, we very unlikely even gonna overtake them. And then all of a sudden uh, you see that little red dot on the horizon when you're getting close to the, to the coast and you say, okay guys, we're not going to win this this Volvo Ocean Race this year, but uh, let's just keep keep fighting and do our best. And uh, we got the force in that leg. Uh, still, if you look if you look back, we sailed very fast again this leg, but uh, we just missed out in the beginning, and that was uh, that was dearly and expensive. I mean that that position report, that moment where you can see them. Um, I'm wondering, was it? It's done. It's done. Or was there a case of, okay, it's unlikely, but we can, like you say, you know, with the finish in Newport and Mafre sailing, you know, 100 miles to win by one boat length. Did you know we're not going to be able to do this or, or, or were you still hanging on? Uh, because at, at that stage, uh, and uh, I've been sailing uh, a big part of my life on that coastline. And, and you just know, especially with the weather course nowadays, it was very, very unlikely, especially at the time of the day that it would, uh, how we say it, would crap out the breeze. So uh, we just knew when we saw that <clears throat> the dot on the horizon and just the angle what they had, they had it in the back at that stage. Uh, of course, it's, it's never over until low, but, but I just knew in my heart uh, they just keep the breeze until, uh, until the end. And of course, they kept and we kept a good breeze going in as well. So it's, uh, it's one of these things. You're not winning the race. Of course, you would love to win it in your home uh, hometown or, let's say, home country. Yeah. But it's, it's, I think that says something again about the team because we had so much obligation going on that week. And then there was one more import race and there was still one trophy on the line. And it was even though it was only third place. And it was uh, Axel Nobel was ahead of them. And we knew we had to beat them in the last import race. And if we would do that, then we would be on the podium on that as well. And uh, yeah, we sailed uh, a fantastic... Uh, last event and uh, you're only as good as your last result and so we, we won that import race and, and finished actually on the import series on the podium as well so uh, well done team Brunel I say that everybody <laughs> who's listening hopefully the girls and guys are listening I mean it, it must feel it must feel like it wasn't third it was it was you know it was it was a hair's breadth we were so close can you file it away with your other thirds or does it does that one oh a lot closer. Yacht racing, yeah. Very simple. It's yacht racing. You know what's going to happen? There's only one winner, and and I think that's one of the things. So that's that's always my approach. So sooner or later, it, it goes your way as well. And and in this race, it hasn't happened yet. But you know, in a lot of other events, and and, and I, fortunately, I can say that I won a lot of races. And and sometimes I was was behind and came back, or was in the lead from the beginning, and and you finish a fantastic event. So it's it's just you have to accept because if, if I had that crystal ball, I would be probably not even sailing. I would do a lot of other good things, but uh, it's it's just you have to you have to just admit that that other people have beaten you, and and that's of course that that's tough, and it's one of these things. What is always a challenge as well because you like to come back, you like and you say, okay, what didn't we do right? What the other guys did 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 better than us? Let's say that. But what can we learn from it? What can I bring with it? with me for in the near future for other events. And it doesn't have to be the Volvo Ocean Race. It can be just our uh, Wednesday night uh, race here at the local club. It's just, it, it's just a matter of everybody has to keep learning. And uh, of course, it's a, it's a complicated sport. When you finished and you sailed ashore, uh, you were very good. And you came up actually into our little makeshift studio on the hard. And I remember I was talking to you and Shabby Fernandez as well. I was doing a little interview and I think I think I asked you, you know, what's your plans? You know, you know, how does that feel? Will we ever see you in the race again? And I remember you with utter confidence, total self-belief said, oh no, I'll do the next race. And it was, yeah, I, go on, I go think, on. I think that's one of these things. And, and, it's, and it's funny enough, if you look at all the people who are racing this race, 
there's a lot of people who come back eh? and it's and they probably have the same reason than me they they just love it it's 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 a fan, it's it's a fantastic way of making your living i i agree but just the whole all the aspects the nature and the team uh being out there in the middle of nowhere it's uh, and and fighting the elements that is something that you have to be probably special for it eh? it's the same as uh, guys and girls who climb the everest why the hell do you want to climb up there i would say but they probably say the same uh, same about us. So it's uh, it, it's it's in you or it's not, and I've got it in me. So you're going to do well. You're hoping anyway to do the next one. This is autumn 2021, and at the moment um, you're sailing. You know you've got a 65. You're out sailing. This is childhood one, and I think it's it's rare sometimes in our sport that you are able, or any sport, that you're able to really. Um, do some real good and kind of fly a flag quite high. And this foundation that you're that you're sort of representing and showcasing to the world, um, it's interesting to talk to hear you talking so passionately about getting young people into the to the teams and sort of shepherding them through. Was it a natural fit to be sailing for a foundation that works in a way to help children? Did it just feel like, oh, this is this is a double win? Well, of course, it's. Uh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a father myself, and I, and I think that's one of these things, uh, and especially when you're getting older, you just see how much terrible things that are happening around the world uh, to, to children. And, and even in countries, and well-developed countries, if you see the numbers, it, it's scary. There is actually a really good thing about the coronavirus epidemic happening right now, because that happened, and there has been a lot of focus as well on just on abuse of children and violence against them. In a lot of countries you see now, there's a lot going on. And it, it is, unfortunately, it's happening because more people back home. But in a way, it's, it's actually, it comes out more in the media. And of course, when we had the opportunity uh, in Sweden, and it was actually one company called Sletto, uh, who said, we have this great foundation together with the Pella Norwea. He said, it would be an idea. We want to like to put some money in, and 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 you guys represent us for at least a year. And it's we have a contract uh, till October with them to sell under the name and to make publicity for them. Uh, so that they, they don't pay a penny for it. Mm. But it's just one of these things. Eh? It, this has gone to our heart, and I think the, the Childhood Foundation is a fantastic course. And uh, and we will see if, if they will continue or not, but uh, we have to keep our minds open. And I think that's one of the things, so you, you know, it's it's never over until you've got the money in the bank. I think it's a, it's a great setup, having a good course. And uh, so we just keep looking at other options as well, because if you put all your eggs in this one basket, then if it doesn't go your way, then you might just uh, punch yourself in the face and say, mm, why haven't we done that? So we're looking at other opportunities as well because we're living in a free. Sure, uh, and, and I can imagine that um, getting yourself, as everyone always says, getting yourself to the start line, and that business side of running a team and the corporate side of it is is a huge, huge challenge. If you weren't able to get your boat, your team, skipper, to the start line, would you watch leader for another team? Would you put yourself out there? I probably won't. Uh, I say that very honest. I might do a, a leg or two. That's that's possible, but I don't think the entire race because there's so many other opportunities on right now as well. And I think it's one of these things. I've got. A, I'm, I'm probably quite a strong character in a way, and uh, and and it's just. I don't think it would be smart to put me together. I, I'm just saying, uh, David Witt, for example. Even I think he's a. I, I love him. I think he's a great, great kind of guy. But but we have probably two completely different styles. So so mm. that's probably not going to work. And I think as well. And uh, if you have younger people, it's it will be it will be quite a hard mix. And that's why I say if you just come in for one leg or two legs, that's uh, that's probably still still a thing to do. But uh, let's just uh, aim for being us, being myself on the start line that I can run my own campaign because that will make uh, life way easier for myself as well. Are you as are you as forceful a personality, as competitive on your Wednesday night, on your Saturday afternoon racing in your local club? Are you able to sort of go, I'm going to take this race easy? Nah, I think that, that, that's <laughs> it's in us. You, you just, otherwise I wouldn't go, go racing, eh? If I just, then I could just sell from A to B. 
uh, maybe with the barbie on the back of the boat and uh, and maybe a nice glass of wine but but, but that's if you go racing you want to win uh, if not and then there's probably people out there who are racing and just for the joy and the excitement of it uh, but I think the moment that they that they have a win or more wins then you you're going for more and I think that's one of these things once you are a racer you're forever a racer and you like to win and that's even when you're cruising you see a little boat on the horizon if I'm cruising with my family I want to overtake that guy or girl who sails on the horizon and, and even and hopefully they're way way bigger than you are and then can sail past them so it, it's I think it just sits in you and uh, that will never change it's a pleasure to hear you talk about your passion for sailing and uh I can only wish you the best of luck and for the for the sake of all the fans and myself as well really hope we see you on the start line for the next edition we do our best for that <laughs> all right you. cheers take care bye a bower becking describing why it is that he is so addicted to this race and so addicted to competitive offshore sailing surely a name that we're going to see in many more editions to come if you enjoyed this interview like and subscribe for more we've got plenty more interviews lined up for the next few weeks but as always we are taking your suggestions let us know in the comments below who you want us to talk to and what questions you want asked see you next time